Hello, everybody. Um, I will talk about egocentric multi-view 3D object detection now. Now, as Chris has introduced, this is one of the core um, egocentric perception tasks that our team is working on. The problem is to take in multiple views of the same scene, where we have poses and calibration for the images, and then produce an object-based reconstruction. Now, for this, uh, for this tutorial, I want to focus on how to leverage th this egocentric data we collect from Project ARIA to produce 3D object detections and various different research that we have um, towards that goal. On a high level, there's two different approaches to 3D object detection from multiple views. One is the late fusion route, where we detect objects in multiple frames independently, and then reason about the 3D geometry and produce the 3D, the 3D object detections after association. The other approach is early fusion, where we first take the information from multiple views, produce some kind of 3D representation, and then perform 3D detection on that 3D representation. I will first talk about the late fusion route. We started this research a while ago, so you're not going to see any ARIA data here. In this project, uh, Frodo, we first detect objects in 2D, describe them using code, codes for each object detection, associate them and produce a 3D bounding box, and then initialize a 3D reconstruction that we can then optimize and, and then you know, re return a dense object at the end. In the next work um, that we called ODAM, Object Detection, Association, and Mapping, we addressed some of the shortcomings of Frodo, namely to directly detect in 3D, as you can see on the right, and then learn how to associate and instantiate these, the 3D models, uh, the 3D bounding boxes in the world frame. So you can see the tracks here color-coded. And then finally, we had some scene optimization to improve the bounding boxes that we get. And lastly, this is very new work that we're, we just submitted to NeurIPS. We worked with our FAIR collaborators on improving the 3D bounding box detectors at a very fundamental level. We call this QBARCNN. Uh, in order to improve this, we not only improve the model architecture itself, but we also um, are going to release a new data set called Omni3D that has you know, 230,000 frames with over 300, uh, 3 million uh, 3D bounding box annotations. What you can see here is zero-shot transfer onto ARIA data, so we never, this model never saw any ARIA data or any annotations on ARIA. So what do we discover on this late fusion route? Late fusion can be brittle because object detections are done independently per, per, per frame, so the object detector does not have access to all the multi-view information that we actually have. So that you might commit to wrong object detection. Then also you need to associate the object detections across frames, which also can introduce problems. To address this, I've shown work that actually learns um, how to associate detections using a graph neural network. Um, this was the ODEM work. And then also, if, of course, if you improve the 3D bounding box detector itself, then that association becomes easier. And so that was the Omni3D and QBRCNN work that I shared. Now switching um, to exciting work on early fusion. This was work with an intern called Johanna, who's actually in the room. So here, we, we perform 2D encoding per frame. And then instead of now detecting objects on these 2D encodings, we first lift these into a 3D feature volume, so a, a grid of features, and then perform object detection in 3D using a 3D CNN. So in more detail, we have a 2D feature per network that produces 2D feature maps per frame. And then for every uh, voxel in our feature volume, we sample the 2D features that the voxel center projects to, and then use a, a transformer per voxel to fuse the features into a voxel feature. And this, these, feature vo these voxel features are then fused and, and you know, basically done, done higher level inference on them using a 3D feature permit network. The, the object detector is just standard um, um, objects as points uh, detector in 3D. This is the detector running um, on our internal ARIA data. 
you can see this is in the same scenario that Chris described. We know all these objects. We've trained the detector specifically for all these objects. On the, on the 3D view, you can see the, the feature volume bounding box moving through space. And you can kind of see a slice through this feature volume encoded using PCA. So you can see that the features are actually spatially persistent. And then the object detections are, are reprojected into the, the frames below. So you can see the object detector works quite well and the object detections are stable. So generally what we've seen is that this end-to-end -end, uh, network performs more robustly with, for 3D object detection um, with a slight downside that the feature volume itself is memory intensive, so the training is a bit uh, harder. Now, I want to highlight that this recent work that was published on Archive called Raytran um, that basically shows in a very similar approach that this SG state-of-the-art and this kind of approach is to state-of-the-art performance on ScanNet uh, for 3D object detection and basically takes our crown from ODAM that was previously in state-of-the-art. So all in all, we've seen that 3D object detection is a key egocentric perception task and that by fusing multi-view information collected from Project ARIA, we can substantially improve the performance of these 3D object detectors over single frame uh, 3D object detectors. And with that, I want to open um, for some questions from the audience. Is there such a thing as mid-level fusion? Mid-level information. Fusion, right? You have early and late. Is there oh, mid-fusion, mid yes. I guess you could think about like fusing local, local shapes first and then doing 3D object detection on top of that so that you can do some more self-supervised um, learning on, um, to produce those mid-level kind of local shape informations before doing 3D detection. So what do you see as the open research challenges for us, given this data? Where do we start? Yeah. <laughs> Richard. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, I'll take a crack at that one. Um, the, the exact reason for making ARIA and then you know, ARIA data sets and showing what we've been doing on some of it publicly um, is exactly because we can't solve all these problems. Uh, in fact, we're just we're at the tip of the iceberg. Um, and really the biggest, you know, like we just saw with early fusion, late fusion, these are two ends of the spectrum of taking take late fusion, tons of current technologies that exist for 2D and then trying to mangle them into the fact that actually data is from a 3D world and you're just getting projections of them in your images. And if what you really want is a persistent prediction, for example, of that bounding box, actually you want the object, then that's yeah, not necessarily the right thing to do. But most of our community has been working on 2D. Uh, so that's one approach. At the other end, you've got these early stage fusions, but really you can count the papers on like just a couple of hands, right? Yeah. Um, really that early stage fusion approach, which says, observations of the world in the images, in audio, et cetera, are projections of some 3D thing out there, some 3D reality. And if only we could start to think about fusing and estimating, like, for example, the SLAM systems do, fundamentally in 3D, then we can do things like make predictions and solve problems, uh, for example, like power efficiency and, and quality, where a single frame will not cut it. Uh, so if you if you start to look at this egocentric data, you'll see that often objects are out of the out of the frame, right? And so then what do you do? So you, you, your two D system just fails. So you start to have to do something. Whereas the concept of persistency and consistency of the three D world comes in. So the answer is every kind of problem in, in computer vision that has been tackled kind of just needs to be tackled again, but in 3D. Um, and on top of that, we went through a paradigm shift where it's like, you know, beautiful connect showed us that, you know, you can have depth, but it doesn't necessarily solve the fundamental representation problem. So we need to do it without depth cameras. You know, that's, a, that's another thing. And uh, beyond that, if we keep going, then actually you need to do all this on about 10 milliwatts of power, not like 100 watts or not a kilowatt or not burn, you know, kind of like we do on our clusters to build our models. So there's a lot is, uh, is like, you know, the short answer. But um, yeah, certainly interested to uh, take up any, any considerations where you think we're missing, uh, you know, big areas that you've already got going. We'd love to get those collaborations going. Yeah, great question. For this object detection, 3D object detection, <clears throat> what's the current stage 
on the performance. For example, we can run real time on an NVIDIA GPU or, or cell phone or uh, desk, desktop. Yeah, the, this system runs real time with a state of the art GPU. Um, given that you guys have posed images, did you consider using nerfs because you'll not have the problem of the cost volume, right? Um, Nerf is an optimization-based method, which, which makes it um, harder in this case to be real-time because you would have to basically start optimizing your Nerf field and then maybe run some object detector on the Nerf field. But nobody knows how to disentangle Nerf fields that well, right? Like, Nerf, you know, you might encode the Nerf field as a, as a big code that now represents your local you know, local space or something, that would take a while to encode. Now, of course, there's these fast methods now that take a few seconds, right? Um, which is an interesting direction. But then in the end, you know, do you have to decode it again into a three representation so, we, so that we know how to do 3D object detection? Or can you directly somehow do some like transformer-based inference on the code that describes this space? I think there's a lot of really interesting future directions. Now, the reason why we went with just a straight feed forward pass for this is because we're really focused on uh, real time nature of it. And this was a way to you know, get real time <laughs> back when we started this project. Now, the nerf based things are coming out recently. So, so the fast. If, if uh, speed is solved, hmm? then if, if uh, speed is not an issue, you would use nerfs. You, you, you might use it. Yeah. It's hard, it's hard for dynamic scenes as well. Um, the, the question was, what, what open source library do we recommend for making these videos? And this is great. <laughs> Pangolin. <laughs> yeah, yeah, so you can, of course, come and learn. Uh, during an internship with us. Um, but the library that we use for this specifically is called Pangolin. It's developed by one of our former uh, members, Stephen Lovegrove. You can find it on GitHub. And in the ARIA data tools. Yes, ARIA data tools. The, the visualizer that um, Pierre sh shared earlier is also based on, on Pangolin. So you could look at that code and get started from there. Uh, my question is on the multi-view object uh, pose. So, uh, I might have misunderstood, but correct me if I'm wrong. So uh, these features, 2D features, you back project them to the cost volume, right? So it's, it's essentially, but it's, um, it's slightly better to think of sampling the images from the projection of the voxel centers. Oh, I see. Because then you get exactly, you know, you, you already have the voxel centers somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. And then you just project them into the images. You sample them at, with a bilinear interpolation versus like taking a, a pixel and then project, like producing the ray, and then having to somehow find the closest voxel to that ray. Oh, I see. So I was just wondering, like, how you combine the features in the volume? Because if you have a lot of uh, uh, images in one pose. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So the, the, that was one of the key things of the method, is so that we. We sample all, all frames that are observed as voxel. And so we get a set of 2D sampled features. And then uh, we use transformers, which are you know, you know, to fuse them. And so the way that's done is, because transformer can handle arbitrary numbers of input tokens, mm -hmm. you can basically just you know, concatenate all the images that, image features that you could sample. So this could be any number. Um, and then have one token that basically says, I'm the, the <laughs> the voxel feature. Um, so you put all these um, into the transformer, and then at the output, you, you take whatever transformation you get for that um, voxel feature token, mm -hmm. and that gets then, uh, that, that's your fused um, feature volume. And then a feature, voxel feature, and then just by virtue of doing backpropagation to the whole thing, mm -hmm. you learn how to fuse the multi-view information. I see. So second question is regarding scale, if you like increase like the volume if you have like an entire house rather yeah. than so does that so so right now the system works basically on a local feature volume and the the, the main reason is that um, is memory right so as i said the, the main drawback right now is that it's memory limited so if you wanted to directly fuse a large set of images into a bigger feature volume then yes you would probably be like limited uh, on, on memory for 
especially during training. Mm -hmm. So then you can play with the resolution of the voxel grades. You can play with how many frames you give. So you, there's ways, of course, of getting keyframes from your video streams instead of giving it all the frames and so on. I can have like multiple grids which are overlapping. Yes, so that's the other thing. You can, you can have like basically video snippets, mm -hmm. lift those to local feature volumes, and then have ways of fusing the local feature volumes. Mm -hmm. um, so there you could think of like incremental ways that then become kind of reminiscent of Kinect Fusion, but in a feature space. Also, have you thought about like improving pose itself from what you've learned? Um, for the purposes of, of our research, we usually assume that pose is good. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> yeah, thanks, Jacob. And <laughs> basically, <laughs> but to be honest, yeah, we have not tried. But of course, you could imagine that in similar ways that um, nerf models are able to backpropagate into the poses, you could try and do similar things here or try and correlate feature volumes from different video snippets and then regress relative pose, things like that. But for, for the purposes of that, we've been focused on the reconstructing the objects and not uh, and just assuming the, the poses are good. Awesome, thanks.